Hi there, uh, LaserTech and uh, Indian River State College as well are welcoming you to the lecture 6 of our uh, video series in Introduction to Photonics. Uh, the title of this lecture is uh, Optical Handling, Positioning and Care. In this lecture, uh, certain practical aspects of uh, optical components and mounts are going to be presented uh, that are going to give you a certain uh, level of knowledge uh, that is uh, important for any kind of photonics tactician uh, that is working in a photonics lab. So we are going to be talking about uh, the construction and use of different mountings for lenses, mirrors and uh, other optical components. We are also going to explain how single and multi-dimensional translational and rotational stages work. We are also going to describe how to set up optical systems involving components, optical benches and vibration-free tables. Certain uh, time is going to be spent on uh, elaborating uh, how to inspect surfaces of optical elements for scratches, chips or digs, and uh, a few other things that uh, would uh, give you a reasonable uh, set of skills uh, at least on a theoretical level as to what you need to pay attention to and what you need to know about uh, when you are working with different types of components in a photonics lab. We are going to start with the optical bench or rail. Uh, this is a, an important uh, optical mount that can be uh, used, that's being used in almost every uh, photonics lab. Uh, the, this uh, type of optical mount has a long stable base on which uh, optical components can be mounted and can have uh, different cross-sectional shapes. Uh, so it uh, enables uh, different types of optical mounts with the reverse geometrical configuration to be uh, positioned and move along the rail so that uh, along one single rail you can establish a full optical uh, system. What kind of optical components you can mount on uh, these types of rails? Uh, all possible optical components such as lenses, mirrors, uh, filters, detectors, uh, uh, etc. Uh, component supports are attached to the rods with adjustable heights and then mounted onto the, uh, up to the uh, rail. Uh, see on the left hand side uh, you uh, have a cross-sectional view of an optical uh, rail. We can see that down on the bottom we had a specific type of a, a cross-section of a triangular shape and then up here we have an optical mount where a specific type of a component, in this case a uh, lens, is being mounted onto the rod uh, uh, and a specific uh, holder. And then um, you can see two locking screws if these uh, two screws are uh, lo uh, loosened, you can uh, slide this uh, entire vertical uh, optical mount along this rail uh, and uh, position it at different, uh, a different position along the rail. The cross-section of an optical rail can be either triangular, double rectangular rail, or flatbed. So we are going to describe each of the three briefly. So first, uh, as far as triangular rail is concerned, it can be made out of different types of uh, metals, such as aluminum, uh, cast iron, uh, steel. The triangular rail would have two grooves on either side of the rail that are used to guide the carriages and secure them on the side with the locking screw. So you can see the two V grooves on, uh, on the left side and on the, uh, one on the left side and one on the right side of this uh, optical rail that are being used to, uh, to uh, slide uh, this uh, full optical mount that's being shown here. And you can see that the two locking screws are kind of tightening along, the, along the, these two uh, V grooves uh, and establishing uh, the, the, uh, the possibility to uh, lock or secure uh, the optical uh, mount with the uh, optical component at a specific position along the rail. You may also come across double rectangular rails. Uh, these are generally made out of aluminum. Uh, we have two rails that are parallel to uh, each other with a fixed spacing between them. The length of this type of uh, optical rail can be between 15 centimeters and 2 meters, so it can be relatively short but also relatively long. 2 meters is uh, approximately about uh, 6 feet. These types of optical rails may have also uh, slotted mounting holes that would allow bolts to be attached to a flat table. So the carriages have slots which allow the components to move along the rail and can also be fixed at any point with a side screw. And finally, very often these types of uh, optical rails are going to have some sort of a scale, linear scale that's running along the length of the rail and is used to locate the position of the component. Uh, so the scale can be either metric or uh, in inches. And as I said, it is being used to uh, position 
components uh, at the specific uh, distances. So you don't have to use the uh, tape ruler or any other uh, way to, uh, to, uh, to uh, measure the distances between the components. The next to be mentioned is so-called flatbed optical bench. This type of uh, optical rail is uh, pretty heavy and it's being used where uh, you uh, uh, would uh, need a maximum stability uh, for the optical system. Uh, so most of the time the flatbed types of uh, optical rails are made out of uh, a high grade stainless steel or granite. The rail would have a dovetail cross section along which carriers can be moved and fixed at desired positions. So this type of bench is quite heavy as I already mentioned and it's very stable uh, and it's used where you need a, a maximum stability. So uh, in uh, these few slides that uh, we just presented you can get a pretty good feeling about what you can uh, yeah, what you may come across in a photonics lab when it's about optical rails obviously uh, you will have different cross sections you will have a different um, uh, um, different weights and the uh, different stabilities and then also uh, uh, different types of uh, optical rails will uh, cost differently so uh, if you are the technician or the person who is going to select and buy or purchase uh, an optical rail for uh, your optical system you would have to take into account all these different aspects that we were uh, briefly uh, uh, mentioning uh, including the cost uh, so um, important uh, aspect of your job would be uh, to have a certain uh, set of skills or knowledge about uh, all the nuances of optical rails that are going to be used in uh, the experiments in your photonics lab in addition to optical rails uh, uh, you are going to, to uh, use uh, various types of optical tables in the photonics labs. Uh, one, of the, one, one example of the optical table is shown on this uh, slide. So uh, we are talking about tables that are used instead of the bench rails where optical elements must be aligned along more than one axis and when vibration isolation is required. So if your optical system is going to uh, have a certain uh, uh, 2D type of uh, characteristics, then instead of a uh, one-dimensional uh, optical rail, you're going to use an optical table. Optical tables come uh, in different sizes. They can be with and without legs. Uh, and uh, most of optical tables would come with a, a drilled or and a threaded holes that are going to be used to, uh, to mount different optical components. These drilled and threaded holes uh, are at certain equal distances from uh, one another, another uh, so that optical mounts can be directly screwed into them. The optical tables are made out of uh, ferromagnetic stainless uh, steel tops and they are filled with a honeycomb cores and provide flat rigid support for optical elements. If you um, are tasked to uh, select an optical table, you're going to see that uh, you're going to be um, you're going to be um, faced with a, a huge selection of different types of tables made out of different materials, different uh, paintings, uh, the, the, the size of the threaded holes, the, the distance. So, for example, distance between the, between the threaded holes can be either one inch or two inches or uh, other, other distances and all that is going to, uh, uh, to impact the cost or the price that you need to pay uh, to uh, purchase uh, that type of uh, optical table. Another important aspect to mention when we are talking about optical tables is a possibility to uh, isolate from any kind of vibration of the, of the floor. So uh, certain experimentations, certain experiments that you're going to be performing in a, in a photonics lab, uh, you would want to avoid any kind of external vibrations. And in such a case, optical uh, tables with uh, pneumatic uh, isolation legs uh, are used. Uh, that would basically suppress any kind of uh, any kind of uh, vibration uh, of uh, low frequencies of uh, uh, below 30 hertz uh, that are uh, caused by uh, walking on a laboratory floor uh, uh, at uh, similar similar causes. So these pneumatic legs are designed to have a vibration frequency far less than uh, 30 hertz, uh, so that uh, no vibrations are being transferred uh, to the table. Obviously. These types of uh, 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 tables are much more expensive because they include a certain uh, aspects of, uh, of, uh, of uh, uh, vibration uh, um, suppressing on their, on their legs. So um, optical tables, again, are an important type of optical mounts that uh, you will be uh, using in your, in your lab. 
and uh, as already mentioned uh, they come in uh, different sizes in different varieties there's a huge selection uh, so uh, the uh, task of selecting an optical table may become a pretty uh, enorm enormous if you uh, don't know exactly what you want so it's very important uh, to uh, know exactly what would be the need of your photonics lab as already mentioned it can be uh, uh, just a optical bench with a with a uh, with a with a top or it can be a full table with a with the legs uh, and then uh, very often what you have to take into account is is the size of the table if you uh, want to use a, a smaller uh, tables uh, the issue of stability starts playing an important role because the four legs that you're going to put under that table may not be uh, may not provide for a stability of the table because you don't want the table to uh, be pushed by uh, uh, by the by the people who are working in the lab uh, tables can also come with a certain uh, shelves you know if you want to add those extra uh, extra features uh, so the the price is pretty scalable um, and obviously uh, fancier you go uh, you will have to pay for uh, for uh, for uh, for more for your optical table that you have selected next to mention is uh, different types of uh, supports for uh, lenses and mirrors so almost any uh, optical system that is uh, to be built in a photonics lab is going to have either a lens or a mirror so it's very important to have a specific type of uh, support that is going to uh, uh, be used to uh, uh, position and uh, 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 hold in place uh, these types of optical components. So there's a few different types of uh, mounts used for, uh, for, for example, for lenses. We may have a sliding grip holder, we can have a spring grip holder, a swing arm holder, threaded holder, self-centering holder. So many different ways of, uh, of uh, holding uh, a lens in place. So here we are just covering uh, these uh, uh, holders in a kind of theoretical uh, uh, way by demonstrating uh, you uh, different types through uh, pictures uh, as a part of the hands-on uh, of, of a hands-on uh, experience that you're going to have at the end of this course you're going to have a chance to uh, actually work with these supports to hold them uh, held them in your own uh, hands and uh, uh, mount uh, a few different types of optical systems and uh, perform certain experiments so at this point it's important to um, uh, establish a certain level of knowledge uh, based on the slides that are going to present it and then we're also going to have a practical part where you're going to be working with these types of supports. On this slide we're also going to mention a few other types of uh, supports. Uh, on the left hand side you have so-called iris diaphragm so this type of optical components can produce size or holes of different sizes and then we have uh, different types of holders for filters either a single filter or a multiple filter as in the case uh, C and then down on the bottom we have a holder for a prism and finally a holder for a laser so obviously each of these different uh, supports are being used to, uh, to held a specific optical component in place uh, so that a certain uh, uh, experiment uh, on the optical system can be performed this slide uh, presents two uh, important and uh, very popular types of uh, positioning equi equipment especially the one on the top uh, popularly known as a scissors jack is extremely popular in photonics labs so we are talking about uh, a platform that can be raised up or down or tilted at a certain angle and these types of uh, uh, platforms would help in adjusting the height of different optical components so the scissors jack is nothing else than uh, two heavy metal plates connected by uh, two pairs of crossbars uh, that are hinged at the center and uh, scissors jack is going to have a knob that you can turn and by turning that knob you can either uh, raise the uh, upper horizontal platform or lower the horizontal uh, upper platform and uh, by doing that you can establish uh, or you can uh, set the position of your component that's being placed on, a, on the upper platform on the bottom we have a so-called sign table uh, this type of uh, positioning equipment has two heavy metal plates one above the other where the upper plate is attached to the lower plate on the one side by a hinge uh, the, uh, while the other side has a screwing mechanism that causes it to move up or down uh, and uh, as the screwing mechanism uh, is uh, being used uh, one side of the of the of the uh, 
heavy plate is moving up and down as mentioned and uh, allowing the optical component located on the top plate to be tilted uh, to the to the desired angle so both the scissors jack and side table are very popular types of uh, uh, positioning equipment and uh, from these pictures it's pretty self-explanatory how they are working you're going to use these types, types of uh, positioning equipment both uh, as a part of the hands-on uh, experience uh, at the end of this uh, course as well as in a photonics lab as a photonics technician here we have a few types of uh, translation tables uh, so uh, transition tables provide adjustable motion in one or two dimensions uh, they can be combined with other devices to produce either a three-dimensional motion or a combination of linear and uh, rotational motions so uh, these translation tables uh, very often would uh, have uh, a micrometer screw uh, uh, incorporated that you can turn and then uh, by turning that micrometer screw the top table can move linearly uh, with respect to the bottom part uh, very often there's also motion in uh, two axes that can be accomplished by stacking two linear translators above and perpendicular to one another uh, you can see that type of a translator on the right hand side so uh, the bottom line you want sometimes to position your uh, optical components on a, on, a, on a top surface and you want to slide it either in uh, in one direction or in two perpendicular directions and this type of a translation tables would enable you that type of flexibility uh, while positioning uh, the optical uh, uh, optical component in components in your uh, optical system you may also have rotational stages so in this case uh, these types of uh, uh, optical mounts would uh, enable a rotational motion about an axis. Uh, the uh, rotary stage is controlled by uh, uh, some sort of a gear on the knob shaft that drives a circular ring of gear through a full 360 degrees. In this case, uh, these types of devices can be mounted on a vertical shaft to provide rotational motion to an optical component. And very often, you know, you're going to see these also incorporated into, into the translational stages. So you can have both translational and rotational type of a motion of the optical mount that's being mounted onto, uh, onto the platform of these types of uh, stages. You may also achieve angular motion. Uh, in this case, we are talking about two different types of uh, tilt motion. It can either be a single slit, uh, slit tilt or double angle tilt. So uh, in this case, uh, you have a flexibility to uh, tilt your optical component in either one or two perpendicular directions. Uh, this device is critical in adjusting the position of a laser cavity mirror, for example. So uh, if you're working in a photonics lab that deals with lasers, you may come across this type of uh, 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 angular motion types of uh, holders. Another interesting mount is so-called goniometer. Uh, this is a device that can rotate an object about a point such that the rotation point is unobstructed by the goniometer itself. Uh, these types of uh, um, optical mounts would uh, enable you uh, to produce orthogonal motion about a common point in space. So uh, it's also being controlled by uh, two knobs in, on the uh, to, uh, that are uh, on uh, positioned perpendicularly and this also has a certain uh, applications in the photonics lab not that popular but you may come across this type of device as well the last part of this lecture is dedicated to the handling and care of uh, optical components uh, so it's uh, important to understand that over time most of the optical components that you're using in an uh, in a photonics lab are going to develop certain defects either on the surface or inside the bulk material so those types of uh, surface defects can include scratches digs chips and fractures while an internal defect uh, uh, is uh, usually called an inclusion and also these types of defects can also be the defects that uh, have been uh, produced during the manufacturing of these uh, of these types of uh, optical components so you may have defects on the cemented surfaces in multiple lenses etc so all this can be uh, produced by uh, that can be caused by mishandling or uh, some sort of mechanical or thermal stress that has been uh, exerted on, a, on an optical component so once more you may come across uh, uh, things such as surface abrasion scratches digs uh, edge chips uh, cemented surfaces and all these uh, types of, uh, of um, uh, 
uh, surface defects may affect the uh, performance of uh, optical component in your optical system. So it's very important to play, pay a close attention uh, to the maintenance and, uh, and the handling and the care of optical components in a photonics lab. So as a photonics technician, it's uh, very important and it's crucial to understand uh, that the level of sensitivity to uh, these types of surface defects uh, significantly increases in a photonics lab uh, uh, compared to uh, other types of electronics labs. Uh, because here we are dealing with the light and very often we are dealing with uh, lasers of a high power uh, where these types of uh, defects can uh, not only degrade the entire optical system that you have built and you are working on but also can create a certain reflections uh, that can be potentially uh, uh, damaging to the uh, to the electronics within your uh, within your optical systems so it is very important uh, as a photonics technician to know how to inspect various surfaces uh, for any kind of defect and then decide whether or not to use that component in your optical system. So this slide uh, presents one possible way of uh, observing and measuring the surface defect. Uh, so what you are trying to accomplish here is to observe the surface under the microscope. The way uh, this is being accomplished is first by first cleaning uh, the uh, surface of the optical component within an approved method and then placing it on a stage of a microscope and then using a lamp uh, with a, a condensing lens that would illuminate the test piece and then finally uh, uh, perform the inspection for scratches, digs and other surface defects. So if you're looking at the optical element, that uh, optical element in order to be usable should have no scratches on the center of the lens uh, uh, or within the usable aperture of the lens. Uh, so most of the optical uh, beams would uh, be moving exactly to the center of the lens and a uh, certain uh, distance uh, away. So that's, go that's going to be the, the most uh, important and the most critical part of the lens uh, to inspect for any kind of uh, scratchers, dicks or uh, other type of uh, surface defects. There's also other ways to uh, uh, perform the inspection of an, on an optical element. For example, we can use a laser beam that's... Uh, being passed through a test piece and then you're looking at the output beam uh, uh, from the test piece that's being diverged by a negative lens and focused on a screen so this is going to provide a certain uh, a certain amount of magnification uh, so you're going to see the projected image that's uh, then to be carefully inspected for any kind of local variation or uh, of brightness that would indicate uh, a possibility of a surface defect. So to ensure that the observed variations are not due to the properties of the laser or, or diverging lens, you would want to uh, remove the test object and then uh, watch the image. Uh, and uh, it's important for that image to not have any kind of indication of any, any, any damage in, a, in, your, in your laser system or picture that's being produced by the laser system. Uh, very often you're going to be uh, moving the test piece in a two dimensions perpendicular to the laser beam uh, to be able to uh, to uh, inspect different portions of the test piece uh, uh, for any kind of uh, surface defect. Another important uh, uh, test to be performed on uh, optical components is so-called flatness testing. Uh, the flatness uh, uh, testing is being performed on a plane surface uh, of a specific type of a component such as an optical window and it can be measured with the help of so-called optical flat. Uh, so the test plate, uh, the, 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 the optical component that is uh, uh, to be inspected is placed on, on, a, on this so-called optical flat and then uh, viewed uh, under the monochromatic light. Uh, and you are expecting for the, uh, for the fringes or dark, dark and bright bands that appear due to the interference of light reflected from the top surface of the test piece. So this type of uh, testing is a... Uh, uh, very often being performed in a in a photonic slabs uh, when you are uh, uh, interested in a in a quality of the flatness of a specific type of uh, optical window. This slide gives you a little bit of an insight into what kind of uh, optical fringes you may come across when you're doing when you're performing a flatness test. Uh, so each of these different patterns uh, indicate uh, um, uh, something. So for example, if you're looking at at the, at the fringes on a uh, uh, top right hand side you can see a certain shapes that would uh, that would uh, indicate uh, a warp or a similar type of a surface de defect 
and then also you can see each of these different patterns so in other words the patterns that you are seeing under the monochromatic light uh, would indicate a surface a, a certain uh, a certain uh, presence of a surface defect that can be uh, correlated to a specific shape uh, of a fringe so uh, 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 flatness testing is a uh, uh, an important skill for a photonics technician. So here we are just introducing the whole concept of, uh, of this test. And in the future, we're gonna be looking into uh, deeper into this type of uh, uh, subjects uh, where you're gonna uh, learn all the nuances and details of uh, how to uh, correlate a specific shape of a fringe uh, to a specific type of a surface defect. So with the lecture number six, uh, we are going to conclude our uh, brief introduction into uh, the components, other elements that are being used in a photonics lab. So after uh, we laid foundation of uh, photonics, after we learned a little bit about the light, uh, important properties of light, uh, uh, terminology of light, we also spend a few lectures talking about uh, different uh, components that you may come across in a photonics lab. So we started with uh, optical materials. We talked about uh, transparent and not transparent materials, identified a few different types of uh, uh, shapes uh, of optical components, such as a lens, a mirror, optical window. And uh, we uh, spent some time discussing uh, the optical coatings that also provide certain uh, optical performance. We also spent some time talking about the different types of uh, filters that you may come across uh, in a photonics lab and finally in this lecture we also talked about supporting uh, structures so we talked about different types of uh, uh, mounts rails and benches that are going to be used to uh, support optical components uh, so that those optical components are aligned uh, in a specific type of uh, optical system uh, that uh, is going to provide a, a, a a certain uh, application that you are trying to achieve. And finally, at the end of this uh, lecture, we talked about uh, handling and care of optical components. So that's also an important aspect that uh, uh, a photonics technician should be uh, familiar with. Uh, so this, is, this was our uh, uh, a brief introduction into the photonics lab. Uh, by uh, having the knowledge presented in these few lectures, you will be able to enter the photonics lab and uh, uh, familiarize yourself uh, further uh, with all these different practical aspects uh, of, uh, of, uh, of elements that you're going to be uh, working with in a, in a photonics lab. With the next lecture, number seven, we are going to shift our attention towards uh, different types of uh, light sources that uh, are used in a, in a photonics lab and in general in photonics. So we're going to be talking about incandescent, fluorescent uh, light sources. We're going to be talking about our clamps and many other types of uh, man-bed types of uh, light sources. And finally, we also have uh, a brief introduction into the anatomy of a human eye uh, so that uh, uh, you understand why uh, it is important from the perspective of uh, safety uh, to uh, pay a close attention to uh, different types of uh, uh, equipment uh, used in the photonics lab. At this point, we are going to conclude uh, lecture number six. And as I said, I'm looking forward to seeing you all uh, in the lecture number seven uh, that is going to be covering light sources.